and welcome to Zombies because you're on my Facebook page. <laughs> Tonight, Dr. Nicholas Pericone is joining us for a live video chat. A lot of you have sent in great questions that we're going to be asking throughout the evening. How are you? I'm doing so well. great seeing you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's been <laughs> fun. It has been. We haven't even started yet. We have to start. But you had a nice dinner. We had a beautiful dinner. <laughs> it was all good. So, Dr. Pericone, of course, is known for his phenomenal line of anti-aging skincare. He's also a gentleman who's written numerous New York Times best-selling books. He's also considered to be the father of um, the inflammation theory of aging. So tonight we have a lot to talk about in this hour, but those are things that we already know about you and we're going to be talking about those. But a lot of us probably don't know a lot about your life story or kind of how you ended up where you are today. So why don't we start there? Once upon a time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In a land far, far away, it was. <laughs> well, uh, I grew up in Connecticut, and uh, one of uh, five children, mm -hmm. and it was a rather interesting existence, and uh, uh, enjoyed school to a certain extent, but I was also in trouble a bit because I couldn't sit still. Mm. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed science an awful lot, and I and I like reading, so it was I didn't know which direction I was going. Right. Uh, but I had a, a great dad who uh, was a frustrated scientist and. I remember even at age four or five being down in the basement doing experiments with him. Oh, wow. Little test tube. I think he was growing mushrooms on cotton. So we had a whole new way of growing mushrooms. And then uh, we switched over to a lot of other experiments over the years. And much to my mom's chagrin, because we were using her pots and pans to do these things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where's my saucepan? Exactly. Bring it up in the basement. But he did so many interesting things. And my mm -hmm. mom was a big reader. And it really taught me to love reading, and that, that helped an awful lot, too. Yeah. And she had a good sense of humor, because my dad was in the cheese making, and he was <laughs> aging cheeses hanging in her closet near her clothes. No! It was. It was. No! <laughs> That's horrible! I know, it's just a great story. It's wrong! Story. I know. Um, well, she gets extra points for that in the karma department. She does. She does. Yeah. She's great. Well, she's yeah. 91 now, and she's still in great. Great shape and a great mood, and always a very, very happy person. That's always going to remember that. That's so nice. So you grew up with a love for science. Absolute love for science, and it was. But it was interesting when I uh, went to uh, undergraduate. Mm -hmm. I was an English literature major because I also like reading. Right. And uh, then I graduated, and uh, uh, there was a lot going on, and uh, I had a real low draft number. There was, was a lottery. Ah. Um. Only lottery I won in my entire life. <laughs> And, uh, Congratulations. But I did. I, it's I went, not Powerball. I went ahead and joined the Army Reserves and did okay. that and, and they got out. And I um, actually went to work for a nonprofit health organization called Muscular Industry Association. And that was really a great experience for me because I got to work with patients, mm -hmm. um, also did from fundraising, learned administration, and then worked on the telethons, which gave me a lot of experience in television. So, right. all those little pieces of the puzzle. And then I decided I really wanted to go to medical school. So I had to leave muscular dystrophy to go get a real job that mm -hmm. paid money because I had to save up and uh, worked uh, some interesting jobs and one was for an international flavor and fragrance company. So I learned <laughs> all about business and all about chemicals and it was wow. just a lot of fun and then I uh, started med school when I was 31. You didn't start med school till you were 31, I didn't right, know that. Right. And, uh, did you know I'm not, I'm not only 41? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would believe that. <laughs> but you finished med school in three years, right? That's correct. That's yeah. Accelerated wow. course, and then um, did an internship in pediatrics at the Yale Medical School. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed that a lot, but was very interested in doing dermatology, and um, so left uh, that and went on to a three-year dermatology residency in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, wasn't exactly a garden spot, but it was a great, <laughs> it was a great program. And also learned a lot. It was a huge program, right? So a hundred something thousand patients a year there. Um, and also worked in the emergency room for extra money. So I learned all about combat. And, wow. And, and it was yeah. A, that was an interesting time. And then started my practice in Connecticut and uh, <clears throat> joined uh, the clinical faculty at Yale. Mm -hmm. Started doing research, extending my research in medical school. And um, then eventually started the company. So it's been an interesting road. Well, you know what is amazing to me? And the reason I'm so surprised that you didn't start medical school until you're 31 is that you've done so much in between now and then. And when we were talking about things earlier, not just you know not just your practice and not just research on, on anti-aging. And so you have a huge interest in nutrition as well. Yes, I should have. 
So uh, my interest in nutrition actually started well before medical school. And then I went ahead and formalized the nutritional uh, portion of it and um, have a, um, a equivalent of a master's in, in nutrition as well as an MD in, in the specialty of dermatology. So it was an interesting combination because when I was in medical school and we were looking at some pathology of some disease process, mm -hmm. my question was, well, you know, using the traditional uh, Western medicine, we're treating this, and I understood all of that. But what if we took a different approach and used both? What about a nutritional approach to this process? You were ahead of your time. Yeah, and it was fun because it gave me something to hang this information on. I, I would make it easier for me to remember the disease processes and also get interested and involved in it as well. Uh, as well. So that was all very helpful. And then when I was um, uh, in the early portion of medical school, we had to study histopathology, and that's looking under the microscope at every disease process. So mm -hmm. you, you do two things. You look at something clinically, you see a patient. Right. And then what is the problem? And then you go to the microscope and look under the microscope. And while I was doing that, I was looking um, actually at a, uh, a cancerous tumor, tumor, and uh, noticed there was a lot of inflammation around this tumor. And I uh, looked at other samples, and, and there was inflammation. And uh, um, so I went to the professor. I said, is it possible that this microscopic inflammation may be driving the process of, of, of cancer? And the answer was kind of like a knee-jerk, no, no, that's mm -hmm. the immune system. And I thought that was a bad answer because cancer kind of goes around the immune system. And then I got into this theme, and I'm looking at arteries with atherosclerosis, and there's inflammation. And I'm looking at sections of, um, of uh, pancreas, people who die, it's loaded with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And this theme continued, and, and all, so everything had an inflammatory component, including Alzheimer's disease. Wow. So I started putting this together, and I'm not going to ask my professors, but I know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> Uh, so I was convinced that inflammation was at the basis of, of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And then when I started my dermatology residency, we were just once again looking at loads and loads of slides of skin. You look at the patient clinically, and then what's it look like under the microscope? And found that um, there was a tremendous amount of inflammation in aged skin, even if there was no lesion present. Mm -hmm. In young skin, there was no inflammation. So I said, okay, it's not only a disease process, I think, is being driven by inflammation, but mm -hmm. I think the actual aging process as well. Wow. And so then the next question was, well, if you're convinced that it's inflammation and it's this, this, you can't see it, you can't feel it, but this, this little fire is going on all the time in our body and all our major organ systems, including the skin, then what's driving it? Well, the skin was pretty easy because that's our interface with the environment. So sun, right. computer screens, bad uh -oh. weather, pollution, and you know, all of that. But what about the internal organs? No one else, you know, also convinced that skin was also being affected. And, and thought about my nutritional background and said, you know, I, I think it might be foods driving this process. So there were some tests that were not that available then, but you can do it in an experimental way of looking at total inflammatory load in the body mm -hmm. um, using you know, the old ways was looking what we call sedimentation rates, but then C-reactive protein became available. And looking at that, there was a direct correlation between systemic inflammation and diet. And it made sense to me as a nutritionist. So, mm -hmm. Basically, what I learned was that uh, there is a pro-inflammatory diet. And that meant, well, what's causing that? Well, I found that anything that causes rapid rise in blood sugar, and then, an inflame, and then of course, insulin goes up to push that down, right. it, 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 it lights the fire. It starts the inflammatory process. So if we're talking about a diet that is not going to be helpful, <laughs> it's going to encourage inflammation, I'm sure it will probably include a lot of the things that we enjoy eating. So what are the culprits that we should be trying to be reasonable about? Okay, so a few of my favorite things, you know? Okay. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> um, so we looked at a lot of starches are just bad. I mean, pasta, and I come from Italian heritage, and so bad. that was a mainstay. Yes, that, that, that does it. Uh, and then sugar, and, um, and of course trans fats are not great. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are all things that we have to put aside. And the thing is, we, we actually proved this. We put people on what I thought was my anti-inflammatory diet. Fresh fruits, vegetables, um, a lot of fish. Right. Uh, staying away from the starches and sugars. Within a couple of weeks, you can see these levels of inflammatory markers go right down the ceiling. Wow. Really direct proof. And, and of course, with that, you, patients just look better. They became more radiant. Uh, they had just more definition to their faces because they were not only turning off inflammation, but when you do that, a lot of the water we're holding on to, the edema, mm -hmm. also goes. So you see cheekbones look higher and jaws look crisper, eyes are brighter, dark circles tend to fade from under the eyes, and they wow. feel better too, and the mood's elevated, they're thinking more clearly. 
So all this I'm, I'm, I'm reporting and doing that, but I was also now in dermatology. And the thoughts were, what if I took an anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. in a, a topical form that I could rub on the skin that would penetrate so it would have some efficacy? Would that affect the clinical appearance of aging skin and would it prevent certain things? So one of the things I used as a model was sunburn. Right. We had a lot of cases of sunburn in the clinic because people came in for light therapy and they always got overexposed because the nurses would want her off or the timers wouldn't do. Oh my and I say, oh, would you want to be in the study? <laughs> <laughs> and, Just uh, happened to have a group here to choose from. I do. And uh, found that when I put these topical anti-inflammatories, which turn out to be many antioxidants like vitamin C and certain forms of vitamin we could we could actually reduce the erythema. The redness would go away faster by treating it with this than, say, a moisturizer. And so working with parallel, so I had this anti-inflammatory diet. diet idea, and that's what I call beauty from the inside out. Yes. And then the topicals, and the topicals had to be tested in a very specific way to see if they had anti-inflammatory activity. And then some longer-term studies, well, what about skin that's already has some photoaging? You know, can we reverse the process? And I saw a lot of positive things. Mm -hmm. So I started applying for patents when I was still a resident uh, in, in um, dermatology. So how many patents do you hold now? Now uh, the count is 163. But that doesn't just include uh, medical patents. There's, right. um, I like physics, it was a hobby as well, and so I have this kind of defense company. So things like prevention of, of commercial airlines from shoulder held rockets and, and electronic countermeasures and, and, and stealth using electromagnetics. It's a long list of, <laughs> of crazy things in addition to. But one of the things, um, and again, the, those were things that I never knew about you until we were um, talking earlier. But you were talking about someone you know who has some breakthrough concepts in a field that isn't theirs originally. Right. And so when I heard you talk about these kinds of things, I thought it's the same idea. Sometimes by coming at it from a different point of view, you end up having a unique perspective on something. Yeah, so exactly. I think if you don't know an awful lot about <clears throat> the subject, then you're also not confined by the um, by the biases of people that are in that field. Right. And you bring in this fresh look and. All of a sudden, you say, "Well, maybe this will work," and, and you go ahead and try it, and sometimes it does work. You know what? Very quickly, Katie, I'm going to have you um, just fix that for me very quickly, so I can get some questions on there. Sorry about that. Um, that's me and technology. I let it rest too long. So you were you were talking about nutrition, the diet, and then also topical, and then you said the third tier of that was the supplements. Yes, I you know I was very interested in nutritional supplements uh, for many reasons. Um, I was always interested in nutrition, but when I was discharged from the Army, um, I had a lot of fatigue. And I thought, well, why do I have this fatigue? So I went for a complete internal medicine exam and blood tests, and they said, everything's fine. So I said, okay, well, if everything's fine, I'm still fatigued. And so I started reading some very popular nutrition books, especially one by Adele Davis. She was an amazing woman, um, master's in nutrition, and a good biochemist, and mm -hmm. started trying some of the things she suggested. And some of them were nutritional supplements. Now at that time it wasn't a big thing. I'd go to the health food store. It was like a little tiny thing, and right. go in there and ask for these. And they would order some things for me, and I'd try it. I really felt that it had a positive effect. And then of course when I learned about the inflammation, aging, disease thing, I said, well, what if we can actually uh, have more anti-inflammatory activity by not just having a diet, but specifically taking nutritional supplements that target inflammation? And so I thought I had some very good results with mm -hmm. those as well, like. Alpha lipoic acid was really right. kind of miraculous, and as far as an anti inflammatory, and uh, vitamin C ester, and all of these things. And yet, looking at these same things, I said, well, these might also work as topicals. And so that's how we came up with a lot of the topical products that um, we're using even today. Right, I was going to say those are familiar. Right, so there's this theme. So the foods we eat have actives, and these nutrients can act as an anti-inflammatory, like phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take those same phytochemicals or something like lipoic acid and apply it to the skin, you are now hitting the target organ in a very high concentration, right. and you can see some clinical differences. Well, I'm just going to look and see what people are saying here. Um, I'm not really sure what that one means. Oh, here we go. Um, right, and so, by the way, somebody was asking where Dana is. Dana did an interview with us the other day, Dana, who is um, an expert who works with you, and she's amazing uh, on the air. She has an amazing base of knowledge about your skincare line. She sure does. And we're going to be talking a number, about a number of things with the skincare line. And I completely forgot that I'm wearing really bright socks tonight. I apologize. Um, <laughs> so, 
One of the things that I wanted to ask about is if someone is sitting at home and they're, they're saying, well, I, I want to look younger, kind of take me through what can I do to look younger and what is a reasonable expectation of the different things I'm going to try as far as the three tiers you were just talking okay. about. So I would just suggest um, that the first thing to try is the anti-inflammatory diet. And the reason for that is that it truly has a systemic effect. And don't forget, your skin acts as a kind of a marker or an indicator of how you're doing on the inside. So by dropping this inflammation in your body, you will see a tremendous difference in your skin and the way you look. And this can be seen in as little as three days. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but if you follow the three-day diet, and that's available on my website, mm -hmm. and, you, and you don't cheat, um, on day number four, I just don't say a word. And as you interact with people that you see on a regular basis at work or family members, they're going to say, well, wow, what have you done? You look different. Um, have you been on a diet? Have you been on vacation? And it, it's that different. And we've done this in so many different places. We were challenged on Today's Show and Good Morning America and Oprah, and, and it always works, and it's dramatic. Right. Start there. If you do the three-day, there's also a 28-day. It's a little less strict, a little less boring, and you'll get results because it's really beauteous from the inside out. And in addition to that, I would recommend, if, if your budget permits, to try some topicals with anti-inflammatory activity. But there's some simple things you can do as well, not just a diet, but just drinking eight glasses of spring water a day. Um, and sleep is very important. And unfortunately, I don't have the answers uh, to getting regular sleep, except, you know, turn off the TV. You shouldn't be having bright lights. Don't be looking at your iPad or your iPhone at night because it turns off this melatonin production. And slowly get into it. And if you get a good night's sleep, you know you're going to look better and you're going to feel better. Moderate exercise. For some reason, people think that to join a gym and then go ahead and do this incredible hour and a half or two hour workout and sweat, you don't have to. In fact, you're over exercising because once you go over 30 to 45 minutes, you actually use up your endogenous antioxidants and then you go into a pro inflammatory state. Really? You do. So I recommend. You know, max 45 minutes for a workout, mm -hmm. and unless you know, you're going to be an athlete and you're going to be an Olympic star, well, obviously right. you have to compete. But this is for you know, just for, for pure health and beauty reasons. Right. 45 minutes is certainly adequate. Um, so, so, so lifestyle is a little moderate exercise, get enough sleep. The obvious is the obvious. You know, having a glass of wine is fine, but having a whole bottle of wine probably not great. Having a whole bottle of vodka probably not going to work <laughs> out in terms of the anti-aging. Um, I should drink plenty of water. Uh, I'm not against sun exposure, right? Now, sun will accelerate the aging process in your skin, but if you do it in moderation, you also will convert the oils in your skin to vitamin D, and vitamin D is an incredible anti-inflammatory. And uh, in, in every category of disease, if there's low vitamin D levels, your risk is higher for that disease, things like diabetes and cancer as well, Alzheimer's. Oh, wow. So you need to have a good level of vitamin D. If you live in a climate like we do and you can't get it, then you know, you should probably take vitamin D supplements. I would do that under the big care of your uh, nutritionist or your physician. And you want to maintain high vitamin D levels because it's protective against things like flu and colds. Wow. And also, you know, help in a number of ways. Uh, so these are things we can do that are, are, are affordable, they're available, and they will work. So if I start with a three-day diet, I think you will be impressed. Um, now, as far as nutritional supplements go, if you have the financial means, then the last thing on your list would be nutritional supplements. And there's some that I just think are incredible, like so, coenzyme Q10. I would take vitamin C every day. Uh, I would take uh, some form of vitamin E every day. And uh, oh, wait, how do you know which one to get? I mean, yeah. there are a million brands and types of vitamin C or coenzyme Q10, or, mm -hmm. I mean, is there any any rules, any guidelines, any Yeah, rules? I mean, certainly some are better than others. Some are, you know, high quality, and you get good serum levels, and you get the effects. So how do you go about it? I think someone reputable that, that you look upon as a leader mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, order theirs. Okay. Uh, but these, you know, and then of course B-complex is very inexpensive. Right. Um, if you want to have a B-complex. And so vitamin C, vitamin E, CoQ10, alkalopoic acid, all really good positive things to do for your body uh, if you can afford the supplements. And um, at the end of the day, it's really common sense. You know, if you have a incredible piece of, you know, have a salad and a nice piece of fish, and just some fresh vegetables, and you eat on a regular basis, you, you, know, you know you look better, you think better, and, right. and you're going to have more energy at the end of the day. And this, all of this is cumulative. You do this over a period of weeks and months and years, you will really look and feel different. But you will look and feel different after just three days. So this is wow. positive reinforcement. I strongly believe in this. 
Now, as far as topicals go, I've just done a lot of research. When I got into this, I really wanted to change the whole industry because I felt that the industry was based on marketing and not science. Yes. And so everything is science-based, everything is tested, and with kind of a unique guy, a unique approach. And um, and I know they do work. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and I just meet thousands of people from around the world. I go, wow, this, this really does work, and, mm -hmm. and I like it. But once again, you know, if you have a you have a limited amount of money, the most important thing is your diet. Right? Yes. Secondly, um, you know, the other important thing you can do, of course, is just lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. And if you can afford it, then certainly I think topicals are extremely effective if they're tested correctly and they have the level of science that I that I demand. But yes, definitely. All right, I um, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Fred Sentner was saying, um, please print this advice out. How do I pick a brand of vitamins? Which is what we were just talking about, Fred. So I hope that you saw that. I wanted to look at just a few of the questions. I know we had a lot of questions that came in earlier on this one, and a number of the questions were kind of specific. So. One of the, um, so Phyllis, a number of you, Phyllis and Constance and Patty and Diane, hi y'all, um, had the question, the best product for sun damage or age spots? Okay. Well, once again, I think that we, we look from a scientific point of view, and I think um, actives like alpha lipoic acid with a mixture of DMAE are extremely effective for that. Okay. Um, and they affect it on, on various levels, but I've looked at um, uh, just a lot of, um, of science that we've done, looking under the microscope at age skin, before and after uh, the application of something like lipoic acid DMA combination, mm -hmm. you truly can see a difference in the cells and, and the way they look, and you will even out your pigment, and, and I think it'll look a lot better. And that's something that takes a little time, right? It does, it's but um, it, it's a topical, but you'll see a difference in radiance and pore size almost immediately. Oh, wow. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Barbara and Debbie and Tammy, hello. They were asking, is there any products or facial exercises that you can do for the jawline? And I had, there were a lot of women who were asking about the jawline and jowly yeah. kind of feeling. Yeah, that's, um, uh, once again, I, I think you should try the anti-inflammatory diet, that will help. Uh, but, you know, the, um, the topical I, I work on, especially for, you know, from the, from the mandible on down, mm -hmm. um, really has a positive effect. And I was kind of surprised myself. We did the study very controlled manner. Uh, and then at the end of the study, we, you know, we had photographs, they were, we had everything fixed, the chairs were screwed to the ground, the lighting was the same, and, <laughs> and I looked at this and I, I said, wow, I just, I was impressed because, you know, the, um, the horizontal lines on the neck and kind of mm -hmm. the looseness and all that, I knew that we could pop, do something about that. But, um, you know, some of the um, verticals, um, you know, that I know that's an adhesion of some tissue to areas, and that's usually a surgical issue, but well, those were gone too. Wow. So we were very impressed with this. So the, the product uh, below the mandible called Sub D mm -hmm. actually does give an incredible effect, a very oh, positive wow. effect. And far more, and, I, and once again, I was surprised. My expectations were here, mm -hmm. the results were here. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> right. Uh, but that was, that was really gratifying to see if we can do something with that. So that's the way I would go. Excellent. You know, very quickly. Oh, and with facial exercises, um, I think that electric stimulation of muscles is really important. So is that the microcurrent? Microcurrent, exactly. And um, you can have it done um, in you know, a, a spa or something, and I guess you go once a week or something. Mm -hmm. There are also other devices. I invented one that was never carried through as a product, and it was the electric stim glove. I'm still trying to get that um, you know, through and so right. you can get that out there, but it does make a difference. It shortens the muscles, and the shortening the muscles make you look younger. Excellent. I'm just going to move your microphone up a little bit. Am I wrestling? No. no. Um, I'm just trying to, we've tried a million things to try to get the audio to be a little more audible and I was just noticing that maybe that would okay. help if I get it closer to you and I'll, I'll get mine closer to me. Okay, good. There you go. All right. Um, sorry about that. So, oh my gosh. Wanted to ask, oh, what can I do about the lines around my lips? That's from a number of people, Linda and Sandra and Fran and Diane and Lenny, Kathy, and the list just goes on and on. But I think that's definitely an issue yeah. that we run into eventually. You know, it is, and, and certainly I see it a lot as a dermatologist because as you get those fine lines, what happens is your lipstick bleeds into the lines and, and, and everybody's upset about that. So once again, utilizing uh, things like um, lipoic acid and DMAE, we actually found that we could reduce that by about 80% over a wow. period of about 
Well, it takes a while though, over a period of about four to six months. Okay. But it does make, uh, it did make a difference. And there are some other ones, newer ones we're working on now, um, and uh, using some other active ingredients. But these are, these are issues that can be not completely resolved, but certainly improved to a great extent if you have the right topical. Excellent. Well, I can tell you that I'm going to reevaluate what I'm taking in supplements okay. after this discussion, and I'm going to definitely <laughs> Reevaluate what I've been eating for the last few months, which has been a brutal shame spiral of sugar. Um, so I have to stop that. Okay. But, <laughs> um, one of the questions that we, oh, and by the way, it's interesting that you're talking about microcurrent because I use a microcurrent on my face all the time and I thought maybe it was just my imagination that it was helping. So. No, it does help. Excellent. Does help. Um, Nancy, hi Nancy, she said, I have deep forehead lines and I'm only 50. Any ideas? Okay. Um, Interesting, we did a study on a deep forehead line, so let me kind of break up my answer in a few things. First, I want to talk about, I'm very negative on, on Botox. And uh, what Botox Why does, well, it, it paralyzes the muscles. Mm -hmm. And by paralyzing the muscles, you don't see the lines, right? Because you're not going to be able to make an expression. Right. But um, if we're going to talk about what makes someone look older, it's interesting, it's not the lines and wrinkles. It's what we call the shape of the face. And so when you're young and you look at a 20 year old, they have a lot of convex, these things come out, like a convex lens, right? And mm -hmm. So the forehead comes out and the temples come out and the periorals so pout and jawline comes out. And then as you get older, uh, those uh, convexities go to more flat. And so I was in my office and I was just, I had a 25 year old woman, blonde, blue eyed with a significant amount of sun damage. So she had some lines and wrinkles, she was only 25. Wow. But I asked some of the patients who are not skilled in age guessing, they're not, they're not professionals. How old do you think that woman is? They said, oh, I think she's in her mid-20s. I said, well, why do you say that? She's got lines and wrinkles. I said, well, I don't know, but she just looks that way. Well, she had all the convexities of youth. Right. So if you want to, um, so let's, let's look at someone. Have you ever seen any uh, someone who has lost innervations to their lower legs, like the paraplegics? Mm -hmm. And if you notice, the legs become atrophic. So you lose muscle when the nerve is not functioning. And what Botox does is it turns, it, it, it causes paralysis, yeah. so you're gonna lose the muscle. If you lose the muscle, you lose your convexities. So you won't have any lines, but you're still gonna look older. It's not a great way That's to go about doing it, okay? okay? So you don't wanna do that. Um, so but the next part is, well, what do we do about the lines? Well, we did a study, um, and I did this in conjunction with a very large pharmaceutical company because they wanted to license some of the technology. And we did this with the uh, DMAE yes. uh, combination. And over a period of uh, about eight to 12 weeks, we actually saw these deep lines in the forehead diminish mm -hmm. considerably, and you're not putting a, a neurotoxin like Botox into this. So these, these products do exist and they will help. It's not 100%, but you will look better. And don't forget, if you're doing the anti-inflammatory diet and you're taking your vitamins, you mm -hmm. moderate exercise, all this is synergistic activity. You look absolutely terrific for your age, and if you can focus on those lines, just use the topicals. And again, so, and how long does it probably take to start making a difference in forehead lines? I think you see it probably uh, start seeing a difference in four weeks. Okay. You want to keep on extending it. Excellent. All right. Um, oh, Jennifer wants to know, how can I join a study? I asked the same question. Really? Who was just volunteering to be a guinea pig? You were. That was me. <laughs> That's right. We signed you up. <laughs> and you were right on the spot. He was talking about some of the projects that he's working on going forward, not, not all of which he can talk about right now, but they sounded amazing and very interesting and I, I volunteered to be first in line to try you a won. number of them on that one. All right. Um, oh, Regina said, I couldn't understand what product he said for the mandible. So that was the, um, the DM, right? Uh, yeah, that, that would be the, um, the mixture we call sub-D. Okay, sub-D, sub thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Tammy's excited that she can get rid of her jowls, by the way, just to okay. let her know. Tell her all before and afters. There you go. <laughs> So Sheila was saying that your diet consists of a lot of salmon and broccoli. Is that true? Well, that's one of the items. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, um, you know, salmon is just amazing. I don't know why. I've studied it and studied it, but after three days of salmon eating, you are incredibly radiant. Wow. And it has such great anti-inflammatory qualities because um, of the omega-3 content. Uh, there's astaxanthin, which is a natural antioxidant in those salmon, and some of them are magic, but I just don't understand. But that's the way to do it. So if someone doesn't like salmon, quick give me that book, Katie. <laughs> if someone doesn't like salmon. Well, there's other fish you can eat. I don't <laughs> think they're gonna work as well. Cold water fish. Okay. Um, if, you're, 
If you're a vegetarian, you know, certainly you're challenged uh, mm -hmm. because you are uh, getting your protein from other sources and it's pretty hard, high carbohydrate load. Um, but if you're not, then I think this is the way to go. Are there any supplements you can take to help if you don't eat a lot of fish? Yeah, I think you should be taking omega-3 supplements okay. for sure. All right. I will try. <laughs> What can I say? I really need to work on liking fish. It's just not, it's not my... No, you should. Yeah. I'll, I'll work on that. You'll work on it, and you will develop a taste for it. How long does that take? <laughs> Depends on the individual. Okay. <laughs> Results may vary, according to the good doctor on that one. All right. Um, oh, by the way, Jennifer Soul said, please post this later so I can watch it again. And I just want to let you know, Jennifer, that when we do these, they're live, but they stay on my Facebook page as videos and they are always on my YouTube channel as well. So, And a lot of people watch them later if they couldn't be here at this time. Um, Dr. Paraquin himself said he would have preferred to do a different hour when he was more awake. 11, 12 o'clock when I wake up, yeah. <laughs> so next time maybe we'll just have a late night chat. Yeah, it'll be midnight. Right, it'll be perfect. Maybe around Halloween? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sometimes when I can't sleep, I'll just post on Facebook, and I'm amazed at how many people are up yes. at odd hours of the night as well. Um, all right. Oh, by the way, Sydney was saying that but she said Botox made her face droop, which is something that can happen if it's not. Well, if your, your muscles happen. are paralyzed, yes, yeah. that could happen, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, all right. If you hit that blue button at the bottom, it should take you to the most recent one. Oh, my gosh. All right. I'm going to go back to a few of the questions we were looking at. And one of the things that we mentioned briefly, you were saying darkness and under eye lines, and, and a lot of that can be helped with the diet as well. Sure can. Because that's just, that can help with the edema, and that can help with the general yeah. radiance, yeah. right? Inflammation, right? I mean, certainly there's a, uh, there's a, there's a component of, of genetics there too. I think certain ethnic groups, uh, Italians being one of them, they tend to have darker circles in mm -hmm. the pigment, but it all can be improved by the anti-inflammatory diet and, and topical anti-inflammatories as well. Okay. Um, Jane and Loretta were both asking about what the best treatment and products for rosacea are. What yeah. would you recommend? Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, seeing a lot of rosacea as a dermatologist, and we would treat it with um, uh, topical uh, prescription antibiotics like metronidazole. Uh, then, when I was doing my study on lipoic acid, uh, basically the lipoic acid had a real positive effect on on the uh, rosacea. The uh, bumps that you that go along with it and a lot of the redness mm -hmm. seem to resolve fairly quickly. So I would recommend a product with a, a high level of alpha lipoic acid as a possible treatment of um, rosacea rather than having to go to the prescription drugs. Right. Yeah, those can be expensive actually when it comes to prescription drugs. Uh, and we were just, oh, Charlene was asking, can nerve damage cause dry skin? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. and. I would think it might because what happens is when you lose innervation, especially the skin, then you're going to see that a lot of the, what uh, we call the, um, the nexal groups like sebaceous glands are not going to be working um, um, as well. Now that may be just my observation, there may be no scientific proof of that, but certainly I understand that that could happen uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, So then you want to use a moisturizer that has anti-inflammatory in it because the study I did initially when I was interested in this whole thing is all dry skin has an underlying inflammation, even though okay. it can't be seen. Okay. And when we uh, we actually did the study in the middle of winter, there's this severe uh, dry skin seen on older people uh, on the lower extremities, what's called aspiototic dermatitis. And so we treated one leg with um, a moisturizer, and that same moisturizer with anti-inflammatories added, like vitamin C, ester, and a few others. And the uh, the leg getting treated with moisturizer in it with added anti-inflammatories resolve much more quickly than the dryness mm -hmm. on the other side where it was just moisturizer alone. Excellent. Um, very quickly, a number of you were asking Jackie and Connie and Debbie how to make your hands look younger and smoother. Any ideas on that? Okay, yes. Actually, uh, more than a few. <laughs> um, so hands look um, you know, older uh, because they're always exposed to sun and mm -hmm. we have all those spots and things. And so by using um, uh, topicals, uh, the anti-inflammatory topicals, it really helps resolve some of that uneven pigment and some of those spots and also will smooth the skin as well. Now one of the things you also see is loss of subcutaneous fat yes. on the hands and that makes your hands look bony and uh, so I'm actually working on a topical now that we think might be able to replace the subcutaneous fat but that uh, won't be ready for... Give it a, a Absolutely. <laughs> we, 
<laughs> but we can give you a whole body here. Perfect. Okay. That's exactly what I'm looking for. How did you know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but a lot can be done, and uh, and so you just have to look for the products. And okay. of course, they're probably face products. Just use them on your hands. Excellent. Okay. And you're working on working on something more. Right. I am working on something okay. more. Okay. Right. We won't we won't make you talk no. on that. Okay. You've been sworn to secrecy. None of you mentioned anything about that. Um, Arlene Hoffman had a good question because you were just talking about Botox and how you, you don't believe that Botox is a good idea when it comes to women trying to look younger. Men as well, I don't want to be sexist. <laughs> I know that some men get Botox as well. But is there anything else that you think people do or apply or have treatments with for anti-aging that you don't think is going to be productive? Yeah, good question. Um, in my experience, uh, people feel they have to go get facials and they have to do a lot of other things and acid peels. And if anything causes inflammation, then it's going to be accelerating the aging process. Now, so you have to look at you know the risk-benefit ratio. Certainly, if you have an intense treatment that you're inflamed for a little while, but then it resolves and you look better than when you do the risk-benefit ratio, you say, well, I think I look better. But if you're planning to use some things that are irritating your face, um, I think you're going to be very unhappy with the results over the long term. Would Retin-A be one of those things? Um, you know, Retin-A certainly causes a lot of inflammation, but it's also the gold standard, according to dermatologists, right. in terms of an anti-aging, because you look under the microscope and see that. However, um, when we when I did studies using anti-inflammatories um, uh, and, uh, and and growth factors, uh, and, and looked at, um, we actually did biopsies on these people before and after, and then compared them with the Retin-A, um, we thought that some of these things performed a lot better and a lot faster. Um, than retin-A. Retin-A makes you wow. sound sensitive. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's, there's positive negatives here and you've got you've to weigh those results at the end of the day and, and decide if you're going to do that. Okay. Good to know. Um, so Alice was asking, what is a neuropeptide? Okay. So first of all, let's talk about a peptide. A peptide is a string of amino acids. Mm -hmm. And if you have enough string of amino acids, it becomes a protein. Mm -hmm. So in the body, there are uh, strings of amino acids, peptides, that have function. They act as messengers. And so there are receptor sites for these peptides. Now, there are certain peptides that are found in the central nervous system, so they're called neuropeptides. And they have receptor sites, and they, act, they help with neurotransmission, thinking and memory and all of that. But I, I discovered something in medical school, that when I was doing my, my psychiatric rotation, that psychoactive meds seem to have an effect on the skin. And I started looking at that, but also when I was doing my histopathology, the microscope thing, I noticed that the skin looked very similar under the microscope as brain tissue. Um, and then also we did embryology, skin and brain are derived from the same level of tissue. So I call it the brain beauty connection. So that was a kind of a, a path I followed and came up with a lot of therapeutic topicals that are based on the brain beauty connection. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about it and I said, mm -hmm. so these pep neuropeptides, what about certain neuropeptides? Are the receptors outside of the brain for these neuropeptides. And when we actually did the work, um, I had laboratories do the work, sure enough, they found receptors for neuropeptides in the skin. Well, that has to do um, something. Yeah. So we found certain neuropeptides actually have anti-inflammatory activity and really make you look clinically better. So a neuropeptide is a string of amino acids, normally found in the central nervous system, but there are receptors in your skin waiting to be treated. Mm -hmm. And we put those into a cream form that would penetrate, and that's our neuropeptide cream. And so basically, a neuropeptide can't interact with the cell unless the cell has the receptor for that, right? That's correct, otherwise it's just going to float around and do nothing. So, are all neuropeptides the same? Is it specific neuropeptides or combinations of neuropeptides? Yeah, it's, it's specific neuropeptides and certain ones are, are active in the skin, there are receptors. And I wasn't surprised because there's brain beauty connection. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others that are, are not going to be active. And so you so, can't just throw any neuropeptide at it? No, and then neuropeptides also true neuropeptides. I mean, there are a lot of things, products under the say peptides. They are peptides, but they're not neuropeptides, mm -hmm. okay? And neuropeptides are, you have to have, you know, you can go out and, and buy neuropeptides as a commodity like you do other peptides for, for uh, cosmetics. And so we actually have to have those synthesized oh, wow. by a company that does, you know, synthesis of, of peptides, and that's very expensive. So the products are very expensive because the contents are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny, you know, when I talk to other companies and all that, and, and they're talking about their packaging being more expensive than the contents. I'm thinking, oh my God, I mean, <laughs> our, our contents are you know, 100 times more expensive than the packaging. Right, your packaging is simple and effective. 
Because it's about the product. It holds the stuff. So <laughs> it doesn't run in your hands. You go to the store and you just put it in the microwave. Right. You don't need it. There you go. All right. Um, another question about how to care for the neck and, and the decollete. And that, would that be the same? I, I do. We're talking about the yeah, I do. I think it's the same. You know, okay. Some of treatment, right? Excellent. Um, the best ways to address hyperpigmentation, we, we talked about that with the sunspots. Mm -hmm. um, sagging neck would be the same thing. Same thing, right. And don't forget now, diet's the most powerful way of treating right. things. Because okay. I think, you know, in a lot of cases, if you are, if you're not giving your body what it needs to look its best, and you're trying to cover it up with skincare, it's not. Exactly. You're yeah. not going to be as effective. Um, one thing I remember from that nutritionist I, I studied uh, before I went to medical school, Adele Davis, she has a quote, and I always remember this, on the days you don't eat enough protein are the days you age. You need protein to repair your, to repair your, your muscles and your skin and, and everything. That brings it home. It does, and then you know when I, you know, being a nutritionist and, and practicing dermatology, I did informal studies. So I would mm -hmm. just ask part of the initial question interviewing a new patient, tell me about you know what your diet is like, and just give me like the past five or six days. And what I discovered is most women were eating about fifty percent of the amount of protein they needed, wow. uh, based on from a nutritionist's point of view. And so that added up. They say, well, gee, why am I not aging as well as my significant other? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's talk about diet. And men tend to eat a lot of protein, and women don't. There's, there's different reasons for that. There's, there are uh, chemicals in the brain like serotonin um, that, are, that tend to fluctuate in women, especially around uh, uh, menstrual cycle time. And you can bring up serotonin by eating carbs. So they bring it up doing that, and they say, well, I already have my calories from the carbs, so no right. protein. And this, this is cumulative, so it's not a good thing. How do you know how much protein you should be eating? Um, you know, just look it up. I mean, you look at your weight, are you active? So let's just say a, a, a woman who is 5'4 and weighs 140 pounds, okay? And she's moderately active. Well, she probably needs about, you know, I think 60 to 70 grams of protein, high quality protein okay. a day. And if you ask her and you say, what are you eating? Well, that's not happening. Yeah. Okay? And that's going to be human effects. You're not repairing your cells. Wow. And that's, because that's, that's a lot of protein. It is a lot of protein, yeah. but I, from my feeling as a nutritionist, I think that's very important, especially if you're active. Mm -hmm. And most women are pretty active. They're zipping around in a lot of things. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Running around in circles, that would be me. <laughs> so a number of women, Sloan and Robin, Debbie and Dorothy, were all asking about hooded eyelids. Okay. So what you're getting is some redundancy of the tissue on your eyelids, and that tends to happen as you get older. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's one of the most popular uh, surgical procedures, and um, it's a blepharoplasty because they cut the skin and lift, and and uh, that's a you know if you have someone who's really good, the procedure actually does look pretty good. But I, I don't recommend it for men because it feminizes the eyes, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it just doesn't work out. So I found that using things like topical vitamin C, okay. along with things like DME on a regular basis, can really help that redundancy naturally. And at the end of the day, the more natural you go the better you look, because procedures uh, just don't look natural sometimes. And uh, so let's talk about this concavity again. Well, one of the ways facelift works is you go in, you cut the skin, and you cut the muscle, mm -hmm. and then you pull it back, and you yeah. suture it. So you pull it back, and you don't have any lines or wrinkles, but you've now lost your convexities. So you don't have lines or wrinkles, and you have nothing because you're injecting Botox. And you and really, people say you're ageless because you don't not really ageless, you just don't look like you're from this planet, okay? <laughs> and so you, you're not attractive. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so the thing is not not doing things that are too radical. Mm -hmm. I'm not against surgical procedures. I think skilled plastic surgeons can do some amazing things. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you can do this with diet, topicals, electric stimulation, right. uh, exposure to certain forms of electromagnetic radiation, like infrared mm -hmm. sauna we were talking about at dinner, mm -hmm. uh, there are infrared treatments for the face. All these things are cumulative. And you can look absolutely gorgeous and attractive right. by being natural. Well, I think when it comes to surgery, ironically, um, the ones that you notice are the ones that are not done well. So I think it's something that really gives you pause. If that's something you're considering, then you want to make sure you're really going to someone who knows what they're doing. So do a lot of research. Do a lot of research on anyone exactly. if, if you're going to... Um, do that. Oh, Patty said that she loves to finally hear from the genius. That's you. So there you go, Patty. Um, Sydney Walton was asking about protein powder from Whole Foods. Any thoughts on protein powder from Whole Foods as far as protein powder versus 
just eating fish or something. Okay. So protein powders are fine if you know it's a good source of protein, and there are many good sources: egg protein, whey protein, a bunch of other ones. But you know they're not a food, okay? They're, and it's fine. You know I do a protein drink probably once a day. I'm in a hurry, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to make sure I get enough adequate protein because I'm working out and a lot of things. So I have no problem with that. But don't think that that's going to be the you know that's going to keep you really healthy. It will aid. You know you do need you need protein, and I think it's a good answer for women who just don't want to eat a lot of protein. They don't want the calories. So have that protein supplement once a day, but then make sure you get your couple of meals in. Okay. Know? And that's very important. Excellent. Um, and I just lost it, but somebody was asking about marionette lines. Okay. So. All right. So right. we call nasal labial folds. Mm -hmm. And um, so what do you, how do we go about doing this? Right? Once again, a lot of these things like vitamin C, DME, lipoic acid, they are somewhat effective. Um, in addition, electric stim is effective. Mm -hmm. um, some uh, electro, uh, uh, some uh, electromagnetic radiation, like infrared treatments with the LED lights, mm -hmm. uh, that will help to a certain extent. And I don't have any problem if people go get fillers because they're inert, uh, but the problem is they're expensive and they don't last long. But you have a couple of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> so time it for the special occasions. Exactly. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, oh my gosh, they're coming so quickly. Um, Connie said, thank you for the uh, great interview and all the information. Thank you, Connie. Darlene Foster was saying that she loves your products and thank you for doing thank the you. interview. Um, Alice Hunter said, I always drink spring water, cannot drink any other water. And that reminds me that you were talking about how important drinking water is. Yes, water is so important. You know, all the biochemical reactions that take place in our cells take place in the presence of water. And when you're partially dehydrated, it just can't function well. And also, just partial dehydration can put on pounds of fat. Uh, and this adds really? up. So you can, you can expect you can put one to two pounds of fat uh, on your body um, over a period of months by just being slightly dehydrated. And the problem is our thirst mechanism doesn't work until we're more than one or two percent dehydrated. Okay. So we always stay well hydrated, you're going to feel better, you're going to be healthier, immune system works better, skin looks better, you can think more clearly. Mm -hmm. So just keep on drinking that water. And does it make any difference if it's filtered water, spring water? Well, I, I mean, I like the idea of spring water. Um, filtered water is fine. Um, I don't like distilled water because you're taking all of the minerals out and all, and all that. Okay. Uh, but you should have a pure water source. Yeah. I don't want you to be drinking chlorinated water. No. Not a good thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, oh my gosh. So Patty said she gets it. Water, water, water. Um, oh, Sherry Hubbard was asking about HGH, which I'm assuming human growth hormone okay. is what she's asking about there. And I think there's been a lot of yeah, there's quite a history. There's quite a history now. So HGH was first got popular from a um, uh, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine back in the 90s, where they took these men who were aged 65 and above, mm -hmm. you know, chest, they had no uh, growth hormone in the serum whatsoever, or any. They actually measure something else. It's called IGF-1, and uh, they went ahead and treated them with growth hormone shots, but they were pretty high, but they said they reversed like 15 years of aging in six months. The problem was it pushed up their blood sugar, they ended up with diabetes, carpal tunnel syndrome, and a lot of other things. Okay. But then they thought, well, maybe more physiologic levels of human growth hormone would be okay. So just a number of people started using it under the care of their physicians. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. And over a period, now we have data from about 20 years of this. Mm -hmm. And the big fear is, well, what about increased incidence of cancer, giving yourself human growth hormone? Yeah. Well, they, they, from, from the statistics I've seen that have been gathered now from a large number of people who are on these, that everything, actually all the incidence of, of cancer is actually lower because you're keeping your immune system wow. younger. And uh, they're doing well. But it's not, it's not the uh, end all and be all because I can look at a number of people who have been on growth hormone for 15 or 20 years and uh, they're still aging. You know, they're aging. Mm -hmm. they're, and so what you want to do is if you're going to do that, you can afford it, you're under a doctor's care, that's fine. But you also need to do the anti-inflammatory diet, take supplements, moderate exercise, all that is so important uh, because that isn't the answer. Because I've, I've just seen too many patients who are doing just that right. and not doing that well. That's interesting because I think in some cases you just think, oh, well, if I could afford the really expensive treatment, I wouldn't have to worry about all this other thing. But No, it's not mm -hmm. true because you, you sit here and you watch the... the, the the elite of the world, the, the, the political leaders, the, the wealthy, and they're just aging just like you are. So obviously, if that, was, have access to everything. If that was the answer, you're going to be a little <laughs> off there, right? That's a valid point. <laughs> 
All right, I want to just go a few more questions in here. Coming back. Oh, so Sherry was saying, did you did we talk about dry circles under the eyes? I know we talked about darkness under the eyes, but specifically if you have dryness under your eyes? Okay, so dryness under the eyes, um, I think a lot of that has to do with, with some attempted treatments, no okay. cancer as a reaction, but okay. Mm -hmm. So when you have a good eye therapy, you should have powerful anti-inflammatory activity, then it should be a mild and it should be safe to be used around the eyes. And what you'll see is it will, will resolve the dryness because you're taking the inflammation down. Mm -hmm. When you take the inflammation down, puffiness and the darkness will go down too. Um, it's, and once again, combined with a good diet, it's gonna work well. So it's the same thing as you were talking about earlier with the Kind of extreme dryness that some people, older people, get in the wintertime, and they did the moisturizer on one side, and did the moisturizer and the anti-inflammatory on the other side, and the moisturizer and the anti-inflammatory right. was much more. So you want to have that eye therapy with the anti-inflammatories in it. Excellent. All right. Um, oh, Miranda was asking about adult acne. All right. So acne um, obviously is a huge problem. As a dermatologist, so what do we see? We see groups, so teenage groups, and then we start seeing this late 20s and 30s, another uh, rise in the acne, and that um, hormonal changes. But you have to understand that acne is a systemic inflammatory disease. And that means that if you can drop inflammation in your body, the acne gets better. Now, unfortunately, the dermatology texts are all wrong. They say there are inflammatory lesions and non-inflammatory lesions. All acne lesions are inflammatory, even though they don't look inflamed on, on a clinical exam, mm -hmm. even if they don't look inflamed under the microscope, because there are certain chemicals that are on a molecular level that go up and cause the uh, sebum to get sticky and that clogs the pore and then you move up to the various levels of, of acne from grade one to grade five or six of cystic acne. So everything is going back to inflammation. It's at the final common pathway. So yeah. I took a group of patients and put them on the anti-inflammatory diet with acne. And even people who had failed Accutane and they all got better. Really? They all get better and they get pre pretty rapidly. The problem is people don't want to be on that regimen um, you know, um, because they don't want to stay young forever and feel good. They want to feel well. They'd rather have the ice cream. And look like the rest of us. Right? So um, that's one thing. So, um, you know, acne is a problem, and you do, it is, is bimodal. You'll see teens and you'll see adults. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I really recommend the anti inflammatory diet along with some benign topicals rather than getting into systemic antibiotics and topical antibiotics and all that. It's just not great. Okay. Um, oh, so somebody was asking about turmeric for inflammation. Is that are anti-inflammatories like and turmeric and, and others. And they're very, very good. So if you can cook with, uh, you know, and have turmeric in your diet, or there, there are good turmeric supplements that are made. The problem with turmeric is it's really hard to get high enough serum levels to have a therapeutic effect. Okay. But these new turmeric uh, supplements that are out there, they have other additives that help you absorb it better. And uh, we know that uh, people who have a lot of curry in their diets, they actually have lower incidence of, of, of neuro, uh, for neuro problems like Alzheimer's and other problems. Hmm. brings inflammation down, especially in the brain. That's good to know. All right, so somebody was asking, Carol said, um, could you please repeat the three-day diet info? And I know that you were saying that that's on your website. It's on the website, and it's it's all there. It's, it's easy to do. Get in there and do the diet. Don't cheat for three days. On day four, it's amazing what you can do. So it's a great thing to do before you have to give a lecture at work or you're going to a reunion, have a great date. I was going to say, or if you have a date. Get married. <laughs> right. <laughs> anything anything <laughs> So it should probably be called the pre-wedding diet because everybody be. wants to look your best on your wedding day. It could be. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what is amazing to me is that um, this hour is almost up. Is, is my watch wrong? Is this hour almost up already? No. That's unbelievable. Um, all right. Very quickly. Oh, I think some people are having a problem with the feed. I apologize for that. Does retinol cause hair to darken on your face? Christina was asking that. I haven't heard that question before, and I don't know the answer to it. I don't remember seeing any studies that uh, it, it would, but um, it doesn't mean it's not happening. Okay. I really go with, when my patients tell me they're making an observation mm -hmm. and a connection, I believe them. Right. If they're making the observation, yeah. So Pam is saying um, she gets drinking water, but she's recently read that you could also mix it up with tea and lemonade and things like that. Is, is that okay? Is it better just do straight water? Well, I say a glass of moderation. I say glasses of water. It's what you want. I mean, okay. and then the tea and, and, and coffee and everything else is additive. Okay, so if you if you get your eight in a day, right. then you can drink something else if then, you want. Then you party. Okay, <laughs> completely up to you on that one. All right. Yeah, I think um, we're definitely having issues with 
the, um, the D. Yeah, because it says frozen, frozen, and frozen. Yes. All right. So, well, I have to say that this hour is almost up, so we're going to go ahead and conclude. But this has been the most informative hour, and I know that you loved it because I'm reading all the comments here on Facebook. Thank you so much. And I, I literally think we could sit here for another hour, maybe another time, and just answer more questions. Oh, sure. That was that was wonderful. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. And you know, don't forget if you ever need a guinea pig. Okay, you're on the list. I'm, I'm first in line, and there are a lot of people right behind me. Okay. And I, we'll be happy to give you names. All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful seeing you, Dr. Nicholas Paracon, and that is another hour of great information.